Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Welcome, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Co-op, and so pleased to be with you this morning. I am in the Atlanta area, and we have Mr. R.L. Condor on with us this morning, who is the Senior Vice President of Government Relationships. Good morning. Good morning, R.L. Good morning, Vernon. How are you? I am great. How about you? Uh, I'm doing great, but you're missing one of the worst weather days in D.C. It's 33 degrees and pouring rain, so you're, it's not enough. To, it's not cold enough to snow, and it's just raining. So it's it's a great day you're missing. Thank you. I'm I'm glad. It's cold <laughs> in Atlanta though. Uh, yesterday it was 42 degrees here, and I looked up and it was 43 in D.C. So it's it's not down to 33 though, which is good. But it, it, it's it's chilly and raining here. Let's talk about your work real quick. Uh, you're the Senior Vice President of Government Relationships for the National Cooperative Bank, and NCB is one of my favorite organizations. They've been very, very supportive of this program over the last nine years, and so have you. So you do advocacy work. What is that? Well, advocacy is uh, for, for, for the bank and what we do with the co-op sector. Advocacy is working on federal and state policy and local policy and working with organizations and constituents on supporting and pushing a, a policy. And for me, I have a really cool job. I've been doing this co cooperative policy work for over 10 years. And it's a great, great issue to work on, a great business sector to work on. And I have a really cool job. I work with members of Congress, federal agencies to, uh, to promote and, and protect cooperative policy so i have advocacy is public support being out in the public supporting a particular cause or policy and so that's what you do you go out and well how do you go out and give public support to a particular policy well i have a great example and it's an issue that i'm very passionate about and i and good news and bad news i have become the historian i think i've been working on this for so long for cooperative businesses to access federal loan programs. So an example would be if you owned a, if you started a coffee shop Vernon with 10 employees and you wanted a loan, you'd go to your local bank, you would apply, they would approve it and they would get a loan guarantee from the small business administration to protect your loan uh, and, and to protect the, the lender's loan. Uh, and that's how a lot of businesses get started. They do tens of thousands, hundred thousand of these loans a year, and unfortunately for cooperative businesses, this I'll say the same scenario, Vernon. You started a, a coffee shop, but instead of having nine employees, all ten of you own the business equally, and which is and have a vote and a say in how the business operates. That completely blows the mind of the SBA because of their guarantee requirements. And I've been working on that issue for a very long time. We've made a lot of progress, but. It's it's so important because, especially now, the world has changed and evolved, and there's so much need for capital access for cooperative businesses in urban areas, and it's an important issue I'm working on, and that's the kind of work that I do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's go back and unpack this example that you just gave. You just said sure. if, if I started a coffee shop with 10 employees, so that's the capitalistic model. I started, I'm an African-American and I go start a coffee shop, let's say in downtown D.C., sure. coffee shop, and I need a loan. So I would go to my local bank to get a loan. Unfortunately, it's been my experience, R.L., that for African Americans going to a bank getting a loan, too often we don't get that loan. I mean, I know you said we could sure. get the loan with an SBA guarantee. That's what SBA, Small Business Administration, does. But too often we don't get the loan. 
And the reason we don't get the loan is because we don't have a lot of wealth in our neighborhood. Too often, sure. I would not have the house that I could put up for the loan or some other asset because most banks want that collateral. So the example you gave doesn't work as well in the black and brown neighborhoods as I would like um, because we don't have wealth. Uh, blacks, before the pandemic, a white family uh, on average had $171,000 of wealth and a black family had $17,000 of wealth. And a single black female head of household had a negative $6,000 of wealth. They owed more than they own. So the example you gave for too often doesn't work. But now let's take that co-op example. Ten of us decide we want to start a co-op. We still don't have the, the, the capital, but we're going to start the co-op together, all ten of us. And we are going to be yeah. shareholders and we're going to be owners. And what I heard you say was you've been working because – SBA wouldn't guarantee it because they didn't have one person with that capital. But you've been working to get that loan for that co-op. So how would that work? Well, thank you so much for bringing up the challenges for black and brown communities and to access capital from banks and lenders and things like that. It's even more highlighted in this world because in the past, cooperatives have mostly been, and you know this, Vernon, uh, especially like grocery co-ops and food co-ops have been in either college towns or majority white wealthy communities. So there's been an anti-co-op culture at SBA for decades, but the white community and the wealthy communities have been be able to work around that where they uh, go to some of the wealthier people in their community and get a person, you know, a loan or, or an investment. And, and they've, we figured out ways to do that. The problem now is, Black and brown communities are looking at the cooperative model and going, this is a way I can own a business and this is a way I can do things that are that are different than what I want to do. And now we're, they're finding out that they're still not being able to get access to, to a federal taxpayer program that black and brown communities are, and, and applicants are wanting to use. So it's even more pressed on this that uh, the access to, to, to loans. So that is. Thank you for highlighting that because it's, it's one of my biggest things that I'm talking about is like, you know, we've been dealing with not having access to capital for decades, but now it's really being a challenge for these groups. But I want you to, well, yes, uh, I didn't answer your question, but you want to ask it again and I'll try again on the second, so, the second try. So if, if, if I, on your accept, set, uh, the example, if I and nine of my friends decided to open up a cooperative coffee shop, where we sure. own it. It's a worker co-op, which means that these 10 employees would own the business and we would each have one share. So now right. we want to go as a group, as a, as a business, as these 10 members, and we want to get a loan from the bank and we want SBA to guarantee that loan. How would that work? Well, SBA looks at that and says, someone, one owner has to sign a personal guarantee. And then we would say, all ten employ all ten people own this business equally, and they're like, well, someone's got to sign over their house, or someone's got to sign over their savings account. But number one, that's not fair to the other nine, and good luck trying to figure that out. And it's just not, as as a representative of a bank, it's just it doesn't make banking sense or even common sense, and that's that's the rub that we're having. And but but SBA, they are so tied to this one rule that they're just not able to like think outside the box or want to do to, to meet this challenge. I was hoping you're going to tell me they would look at us collectively and decide to make the loan. But you're saying right now it's the same way it's been. Yeah. Well, I was thinking about this last night. I guess the counterpoint could be, well, what if all 10 employees equally provided a personal guarantee? Can you imagine the underwriting or trying to, get everyone Vernon you've 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 got you've received probably a loan from a bank before or a mortgage mm -hmm, or, or mm -hmm, things like that mm -hmm. do you know a hassle that is for for an applicant to mm -hmm. get all their paperwork and prove that they can pay off the loan and all that okay well have do that 10 times for a $50,000 loan or a $100,000 loan or we're talking about 10 employees because that's it's an easy thing to get your head wrapped around worker worker co-ops can be 
15, 20, 25, 50. Or we can talk about consumer grocery stores, consumer owned grocery stores, food co ops, where you have 3,000 owners. I mean, it's, it's just not, it doesn't work. So you haven't yet. You've 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 been working on a policy where small business administration will make loans to co-ops. Yes. How far have you gotten down that road? We have made a lot of progress on the fact that since the 1960s, there has been a regulation stated at SBA that you cannot. They will not provide a loan to a cooperative business. Forty. 40, 50 years later, we actually worked with the Obama administration to get that regulation changed to cooperatives are eligible now. So so actually, cooperatives are actually technically eligible for the loan programs at SBA, but it's a catch-22. They're eligible, but they still have to provide a personal guarantee for cooperative business, and it doesn't work. And I can prove that by saying... I'm going to guess that there hasn't been, I know of maybe one, that one that we did, and it was a workaround, but other than one other cooperative loan in the history of the SBA, I don't think they've done one. So and the, I know that because we're the we're a preferred SBA lender, and we are a cooperative lender, so we would be doing them if we had a chance to. But you did do one with, was it the Fredericksburg uh, Food We co-op? did one locally, yeah, Fredericksburg. Uh, we did an entity guarantee, and this is getting kind of bogged down in the weeds where we figured out a workaround, but it, it, it doesn't, you know, it, it worked because Fredericksburg was able to, and it's the point you made earlier, Vernon, they are in a great community, a, a community that is growing and has a lot of wealth, and they were able to raise probably more money than I've ever seen a, a food cooperative raise. Meanwhile, if you try to do a food cooperative in D.C. and raise that type of money, it's, it's not possible. Particularly on on in Ward Seven and Eight, where um, folks have been trying to create a food co-op. I'll give you another example, Vernon. Okay. Uh, in Detroit, uh, People's Food Cooperative. It's a food insecurity area in Detroit. I've been there. There is not a. There is one gas station. There is not a grocery store. There is not any type of food or restaurant in the entire area. The people in that community have came to come together, worked with their federal and state and local, not federal, their state and local officials, and raised $22 million uh, in a federal state part or a local state, state and local partnership to raise $22 million to create a 25,000 square foot food cooperative grocery store for that area. There's a business incubator there. There is community rooms there. It's black led, black owned, and $22 million of partnerships, and guess what? The one federal agency that's providing loans to small businesses is not involved, and that's the SBA, because they won't make loans to food co-ops or to cooperatives. And you've, you've had Malik on your show. What a great story. What what a great well, group of people that are, are trying to uh, to do these things. So not only uh, – I, I had Malik on the show – and it was the first time that I was I, I had it I had him on the show and we were in his office in in Detroit because mm-hmm. the bank, as you know, had bought this equipment so I could do shows on the road. And he was the first one that I had and this was four or five years ago now. I don't think it's six years ago, but it's some time ago before COVID. I went to Detroit, I visited their farm. And I visit him, and we sat in his office and did the show. Now, what's sad is in 1966, when I was 18 years old, I went to Detroit, and I worked at Ford. I only went to college one semester and didn't have money, dropped out, went to Ford, worked there, went back to school in 67. Well, it's the fall of 66. But I worked there, and the area that you're talking about was – We're taking a break. Sure. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Co-op, and R.L. Condra is our guest. He's the Senior Vice President of Government Relationships for the National Cooperative Bank. And before we took break, we were talking about Detroit, and I was telling him and the audience that I worked in Ford in 1966 in Detroit, and the area that Malik and the People's 
food co-op is starting was like you would I would have died for. I grew up in Bluefield, West Virginia, and these houses that they had was just phenomenal in Detroit. And it was like, boy, I would have loved that. The guys that worked on the line with me, Ariel, they would take me to their houses. They sort of adopted me, and they would they would talk to me, and they all said go back to college. Every last one of them said go back to college. And I'm so glad I listened to them because the money was good, but we, we worked 12, 14 hours a day, it seemed, 10 to 12 hours a day. And there was no time to spend it. And it, for a young man, it was just, it was tough. But these older guys took me around under their wings and they talked to me. The air was phenomenal. Now to go back where all these houses are boarded up, they yeah. are torn down. It's very blighted in this area. And it's around Motown, um, in the area that we're talking about. And, 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 and so this people food co-op, I've, I've got just very high hopes with $22 million and what Malik and them are doing. It will be highly successful to bring some nutritional foods, uh, to, to that neighborhood. And, um, so you went up and visited them? I did. We, uh, a group of us went up there and saw the, saw the, uh, the area. They were breaking ground, met with them. And, but this story, Vernon, it, it can be told in almost every city in America where, why is there a food co-op there? Because you can't get another type of grocery store to, to move in there. Same, same challenges with DC. Uh, I get calls from people from Memphis and in Arkansas and Little Rock saying, you know, we've got these neighborhoods that we're looking to put a grocery store in. We cannot recruit a grocery store and our communities need healthy foods or, or just groceries. And, the problem is, is that if these were in a small, small town where I grew up, you can get a loan for a co-op through the Department of Agriculture. They do not require the personal guarantee for cooperatives and cooperative businesses. So what this is really hurting, not only is it hurting black and brown communities, but it's hurting cities where the need is, is, is very much needed in urban areas to recruit grocery stores. And have we not learned anything from this COVID pandemic that a grocery store is the, is a corner piece, a centerpiece, and the most important thing that can happen to a community for food and trying to get through uh, challenges that we see every day. And the essential workers that worked in the grocery stores, uh, they, they're not paid essential <laughs> as if they're right. essential workers. Yeah, that, that just showed up. But you said the Department of Agriculture – would loan to a food co-op in a rural area because they don't have the stipulation that you have to have the personal guarantee. Is that what I understood you to say? That is correct. If, if the Department of Agriculture could use their program for urban areas and cities, I, I probably wouldn't even be on your show. I'd be out of a job because you can access those loans through the Department of Agriculture. And not only that, but it's, 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 we do it in the private sector. My bank, as you know, is a co-op lending bank. We do not require a personal guarantee so for co-op loans. And we've done over $85 million in loans to food cooperatives without a personal guarantee. That's how we do business. So you have the, you have the cooperative business sector asking SBA to do this. You're having lenders like us saying, asking SBA to do this. Congress passed the Main Street Act with specific language stating to fix this, to give an alternative or find a way to give access to capital, to loans for co-ops. And the agency has said no. And what I, you know, I'm, I, I'm an advocacy background. I'm a, I do lobbying. I've always worked on getting legislation passed. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that when legislation passed or it, it would become law that a federal agency could just say, no, we're, we're not, we're not going to do it. We're not going to meet what Congress says. I, I was really blown away with that because the Congress required SBA to provide a report on how to access cooperatives. And they basically said, we're just going to educate everyone about what our programs, our existing programs. They made zero changes, zero effort. It was, it was amazing. Wow. Okay. And so I eventually, have so eventually Vernon, someone, someone's going to say SBA, you're a federal agency with taxpayer dollars with the federal program. Why, tell us again why you're not doing this. Like, give us, 
explain to why we're not you're not giving access to a business sector that's you know this is not crypto this is not a new thing Benjamin Franklin founded the first cooperative. It was a mutual insurance company that still exists today. Like there's over 65,000 cooperative businesses in the, in the country or not business, but cooperatives and cooperative businesses in the country. I mean, this is not a new thing. It's, we're not going away. This is a way that people do business. I don't think you would be out of job. I'll go back to that. I think you would be <laughs> in a job of providing the loans to those cooperative businesses through SBA. You, you'd just be perhaps a different focus, or you would find other policies to advocate for. Um, sure. Uh, it's and, and so when I when I said I thought we had gotten further along with SBA, it was because of the Main Street Act. So sure. I thought that you were going to tell me today that SBA is making these loans to worker co-ops, uh, food co-ops, consumer co-ops, um, and the People's Food Co-op in, in Detroit, $22 million, or a food co-op that starts in Ward 8 in Washington, D.C., could get an SBA loan. Or the example you talked about, a coffee shop, if I was a part of a 10-member coffee shop, that's a worker co-op, that we could go to SBA and get that loan the same way you could go to the Department of Agriculture if we were in rural. If we were in Bluefield, West Virginia, where I grew up, or the small town right. in Arkansas that you grew up, then we could get that loan through the Department of Agriculture, not through SBA. I thought you were going to tell me we are gotten further along. So we have, <laughs> we have more advocacy to do. And it may be we, – We have a lot of work. It may be getting the right head of SBA that would be there or getting Congress to – threaten to fire some people or let some people go if they don't implement the program in the Main Street Act. Okay. And also on this issue, this is not a, a law. Or, this is a regulation that they could change over. It's, it's a rule. They could change this overnight if they wanted to. Like, th th it, this has been going on for, for, for over 10, 20 years of, of this standoff where it's like, well, even I don't understand why they don't want to do it at this point. Uh, you know, I worked on the Hill for a long time. I oversaw the Department of Agriculture programs, and that's why it's kind of kind of personal to me. My conclusion is when a federal agency wants to do something, they will do it. And when a federal agency doesn't want to do something, they will find ways of not doing it. And that's kind of where we are at this point, SBA, unfortunately. SBA could go to the Department of Agriculture and see how they do it. And uh, They did do that. Okay. They did do that. That was part of the Main Street Act. They 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 uh, directed the SBA to work with other federal agencies to learn how they do it. SBA met with them, learned about their products, and then SBA also had a listening session for co-op leaders. We we went to SBA headquarters uh, and had uh, two listening sessions about how to do this, and and they still came back and said no. It's mm -hmm. a, it's 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 uh, the problem is Vernon is like. Cooperatives are not like the sexy thing. It's just a, a, gr a great way to do business. And so there's not, you know, it's hard to get people's attention when it's like when we're talking about a, a, a thing that, that a business model that works really well, but, you know, you're not getting your, you're not getting access to the programs. Of the $85 million that NCB has uh, loaned out to food co ops, do you have any sense of how many of the how much it, how many failures you've had, or how much of it has end up in write-offs? They're very small. I don't know the exact number. They're very small over the years, um, basically because you know this, Vernon. Like, if you want to start a food cooperative, you need to do exploratory committee. You need to you need to raise money. You need to get member owners. You need to find a location. Like, it's not like it's not an overnight thing. We've We've worked with some of these grocery stores. It took years to just get to the point where they're ready for a loan. So there's so much hard work, so much uh, business planning that goes on. And then the co-op has to raise the money. It has to be a bankable deal to, uh, to get a bank loan. So for the most part, we, we I do not see, I'm not aware of, of, I've, I know of a few that have not gone well, uh, but for the most part, these are viable bank. By the time by the time a bank makes a loan to a, a grocery co-op, 
all the ducks are in order and they, they have just as good a chance of making, making it as any other business does. So there are seven co-op principles. What we've been basically talking about is the fifth principle, education, training, and information. That's the principle that, that I first understood when I learned about co-ops and the reason I fell in love with this model. Co-ops provide education and training for their members, elected representatives, managers, and employees so they can contribute effectively to the development of their cooperatives. Co-ops inform the general public, particularly young people and opinion leaders, about the nature and benefits of co-ops. So that's what we've been talking about, this fifth principle, and that's basically your job. Um, did, sure. I get, did I get that right? That's correct. I, uh, I wish there were more of me. I mean, uh, we, we've, we, have, we have done surveys. We've done polling. Uh, people just really don't understand the cooperative model, especially pos- policymakers. And once you let them know or give them examples of like cooperatives, for example, REI in the in, there's an REI location in DC. Um, it's the it's the highest grossing consumer cooperative in the country. It's the same model as a food cooperative. I don't, Vernon, have you you've been to an REI? Do mm-hmm, you think that's mm-hmm. a business? That mm-hmm. yeah, it's it's a business and. It's the same model as what we're talking about today. And in fact, we gave in the, in the early 80s, REI, one of their first loans when they were a mail, a mail in business or a mail out business. Mm. Now it's grown to this day. Think about how many REIs are out there that can't get loans or can't grow because of the lack of access to capital. We are going to take a break and we're going to come back and talk more about that. And I want to find out how you got into this business. We'll be right back. Please don't touch that down. We've been on the air nine years. We've been on the air nine years. And National Cooperative Bank has been our sponsor for those nine years. And our guest, RL, works for NCB. NCB's mission is to support and be an advocate for America's cooperatives and their members, especially in low-income communities, by providing innovative financial and related services. So NCB has been a great partner in these nine years to get the word out to the public. And so we are basically also providing training information about co-ops. So Ariel, uh, our guest today, is the Senior Vice President of Government Relationships at NCB. Tell me, how did you get into this business or how did you learn about co-ops? I just kind of fell into it. When I graduated from the University of Arkansas, I messed around for a while, and I finally did what a lot of young people do. I packed a bag and bought a one-way ticket to D.C., and I've been here for 20 years after I did that. And I I worked on the Hill. I did work for some trade associations, and I met Chuck Snyder, who was at the time the CEO of National Cooperative Bank, and I had so much respect for him, and I always wanted to work in cooperatives, or I always wanted to work for the bank, and then until I started working for the bank and another culture associates for that in CBA, I, I'm like everyone else out there. Like I've heard of cooperatives. I sounds good. I, I got my electricity from rural electric co-ops. I, I know what I knew what a credit union was, but I just did, never even really looked into it. And then once I started working for the bank and then working for uh, NCBA before that, uh, it's been a really great policy job to work on and I was telling someone the other day the other night I, I've been asked to do a lot of things and not once was it not a I didn't support or good thing to to work on cooperative policy it's just it's just a good a good way to make to do business and it changes people's lives and it affects our economy in so many ways so can you give any specific examples of the benefits of co-ops whether it's a food co-op or worker co-op or well, to me, because I'm from a, a you know a small town, as you mentioned in Arkansas, cooperatives 
are across, they're, it's not a partisan issue. It's not like just Republicans do it or, or Democrats do it. There are so it's on every level. So my little small town is next door to a, to the duck and rice capital of the world, Stuttgart, Arkansas, population 20,000 people. There are two, not one, two billion dollar rice cooperatives in that small town. And every family farmer, production agriculture farmer, is a member of those cooperatives, and that's how they make a living and do business. Meanwhile, you can go to New York City and live in a housing co-op, or you can uh, go to Fredericksburg and shop at a at a food co-op. So it's it's across the grain on on different ways of doing business. And you know, you got these rice farmers in Arkansas, and meanwhile in Brooklyn, you have a transgender Puerto Rican hair salon co-op. I mean, it's just you can't make this up on how on the <laughs> contrasts. And so that's the reason why I like to work on these issues. And, oh, by the way, meanwhile, everyone's getting their electricity from rural electric co-ops or doing banking business with a credit union as, as we speak. So uh, it affects our day-to-day business, and it's, it's, it's a great issue to work on, great good policy. So based on what you just said, it's a good time to talk about the four types of co-ops. Um, and I'll try to do this quickly. If the, if the business is owned and controlled by the employees, then it's a worker co-op. And that for it could be any business, any business you could think of could be owned and controlled by the employees. But if it's only controlled by the person that uses the products or services, it's only controlled by the consumer, it's called a consumer co-op. And you just gave several examples, housing co-ops in, in New York or D.C. I live in a housing co-op in D.C. Credit unions, I belong to NIH, Federal Credit Union. Food co-ops, I am a member of Fredericksburg. I'm also a member of the People's Food Co-op in Detroit. Uh, I'll go there to visit my nice. nieces and nephews. REI, you mentioned it, uh, Recreation Equipment. Uh, health. There's a health clinic in Madison, Wisconsin that is a consumer. That the Patients own the, the, the health center. But if a, a group of people or a group of businesses come together to purchase their products or services, okay, they normally get uh, great quality because the business they create learns about the vendors and learns about the products and get quality products at, at the cheapest price because they buy in volume. It's called a purchasing co-op. So farmers, artists, uh, there's a consumer purchasing alliance in D.C. Uh, that's a purchasing co-op. Uh, particular farmers, and that's why the Department of Ag is involved because farmers mm-hmm. have been doing this for ages with rice uh, farming that you're talking about. But if a group of people or businesses come together to market their products or services, they get access to more markets at, normally at a better price. Farmers like that created Cabot Creamery, Lando Lakes, Ocean Spray, and artists like Ujama in Pittsburgh or the Zuni uh, tribe in New Mexico, uh, then then it's called a marketing co-op. So we got these four different types of co-ops, and they the whole range, it could be anywhere, rural or urban, and that's what you were talking about. And the National Co-op Bank can and does loan money to all of those different types of co-ops is my understanding. That's correct. We, uh, we're we more of a housing lender. We do food co-op lending. The worker co-op lending, this is an example of not really we – do, we don't do a lot of employee-owned worker co-op lending, but we provide support for smaller lenders that are able to do that and have, are a little bit more flexible on that. We want to do a lot more uh, worker co-op loans. One, one of the issues is conversions. When an owner of a business wants is either retiring or they don't have children that want to run it or they, you know, they want to get out of a business they created that has a lot of employees, there's a conversion. There's not, we're now seeing that where businesses are, the business owners retiring and selling their business back to their employees, and that's a diff, another way of how uh, we're we're seeing uh, employee-owned businesses grow. So I've had several people on the air now talk about the silver tsunami where folks like my age uh, own a business and now they want to retire. And so it's how do they sell the business or donate it to their children or whatever they might need to do. And too many of these close. 
Okay. Right. Yeah. It's too small to sell or they don't have the assets or whatever. Um, and those employees end up without a job and that community ends up without that business. So if they could convert it, and uh, I think like 75% of small businesses in the U.S. are owned by folks over 65 years old. And how do we get projects, mm -hmm. um, policies in place, and tax laws in place that help people where the employees can own that business. Um, so have you done any policy work on this issue, on these conversions? I have, and, you know, shocker, uh, we have challenges with the Small Business Administration <laughs> on this. <laughs> shocker. So the Congress required a report for, uh, for them to provide access. The report came out with, and Vernon, bear with me on this. If you – SBA views a conversion for a co-op the same way – and here's my example. If you, Vernon, want to sell your home to a buyer, you have to guarantee the buyer's – you have to personally guarantee the buyer's loan for it to buy your house. That's how SBA looks at converting an existing business to a worker co-op. The, the seller of the business has to personally guarantee the – buyer's loan i wish people so, could see my face I, I can't that is oh and i, I like your example because I, i've sold I, houses and there's no way i'm going to guarantee that if i sold my house to rl condra or somebody i don't know i know you but i say somebody i don't know come in and say they want to yeah. buy my house and i have to guarantee that they're going to make the loan Oh, no, it's the same thing Correct. when I got ready to sell my business. If I had to guarantee that those employees, in this case, are going to be successful, and if the, it, my guarantee means that if they're not, then they can come and take my assets, no way. Uh-uh. No, that's, that, that's idiotic. I don't, okay. So that's what this you should, small. You should have saw my face. You should have saw my face when I read it. When I read the when I read the the, the report, I was like, "Really?" They're, they're, I was like, "Are they just trolling us at this point?" I think they're just trolling us. They're just making life hard, just on purpose. Okay. So we've got to get at something to change in SBA. We've got to get something, in, or some people changed in SBA. All right, that makes no sense. But um, there are some states that are doing some work in this. Are you working with those That's states? Right. Who, what states? It, it, when I started doing this work 10 years ago, we had one member of Congress I could name that supported co-ops. Now it's, it's a, a huge group. Senator Schumer, uh, majority leader, uh, is a huge co-op advocate. Uh, on the Republican side, we have friends as well that are supporting this, but we're also, it seems like everyone is, is on this, on this support of cooperatives. Colorado, uh, California, Wisconsin, uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, New York City. It's just people are starting. Oh, and also in DC, uh, uh, Councilwoman Bonds has just helped pass uh, some limited equity housing co-op legislation that's going to make housing co-ops more for housing more affordable in D.C. Uh, thanks to her legislation that passed the council recently. So you're seeing it all over the country of, of governors, of city councils, uh, mayors, seeing that, you know, co-ops are not a solution to every single problem. But they're, they're, they can be a good way of finding solutions to a lot of challenges that cities have. We're, we're taking our final break, and we'll be right back. And I really want to talk to you about the future, a little bit more about what's happening in these cities and states, and we'll get to the future. We'll be right back. Fourteen fifty WOL, where information is power. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Co-op. We have Mr. R.L. Condra on with us today. He's a senior vice president of government relations for the National Cooperative Bank. R.L., when we took the break, you were talking about different states, different cities. You had mentioned Anita Bonds, who just passed a couple laws for limited equity housing co-ops, and she had created a task force, which I had the pleasure of, of working on, 
and Paul Hazen had chaired that task force uh, looking at limited equity housing co-ops in, in Washington, D.C. So it's just wonderful. And one of the meetings halfway through this year and a half work on this task force, uh, uh, Council Member Bond said, co-ops, limited equity housing co-ops are the answer to gentrification with such excitement and enthusiasm that she got it. Um, and you say you're seeing this now all over the U.S. with different – I know um, – the governor of Colorado is very big on conversions, and they are, they're working at helping trailer uh, parks, uh, mobile home parks is what they're called now, convert to sure. uh, uh, cooperatives where, where folks that normally live in mobile home parks are, are at the lower income bracket, and then they can own their own space now. Uh, and that makes a tremendous difference to to them, and so that they don't have these increases based on people wanting to make a profit, they can take that out of the equation. So it's happening all over, and that's what you say you're seeing. And I think that's what we're going to need to get SBA changed. What do you think? Sure, and and I, you know, I'm 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 being a little bit negative here. Also, that's part of my personality about the challenges of SBA. But there is a lot of great stuff going on in the co-op world these days. Uh, you're talking about a mobile home parks converting to housing cooperatives where an investor won't come in and buy the land. And, and these people are now without uh, a place to live. Now that they're owners of the, the land and the, and the co-op, they're, they're now more, they, it changes their lives and, and their outlook in life and where they live and things like that. And it's changed me. There's not a mobile home that I, a mobile home park that I do not drive by and think that should be a housing no, co-op. co-op. That Same should thing. be a housing co-op. And then you have all these great cities that are doing these investing in cooperatives. Atlanta, you're in Atlanta. We just gave a $25,000 grant to the guild in, in Atlanta. It's, it's a group that's promoting, uh, and, uh, worker co-ops for, for black communities, black entrepreneurs. And we're not, we're seeing that in Atlanta. It used to be just be California, right? California and New York. Now we're seeing it in Atlanta. We're seeing it in all these other states where there's just so much. It's just a different way of doing business. It's not for everyone. I was just, I was saying that earlier. Like, you know, I, I, I'm not a believer that it's just like every single problem is solved by cooperative, but it, it's a different way of doing business for people that, that, don't want to work for in a corporate setting or in some cases a for-profit setting. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's just, um, I'm seeing a lot of changes going on. Oh, the example, we keep talking about a coffee shop that could be, it could be a landscaping business. It could be a custodial business. It could be a construction business. It could be a web design business. It could be, an innovative business. It's a group of people coming together, making decisions on, on a business, and sharing the the profits and the losses of a business. And, and you mentioned earlier one of the key principles, one of the key things that's that fifth principle. There's a lot of learning. There's a lot of training that has to happen. Dr. Jessica Gordon Emhart in her book Collective Carriage talked about blacks through throughout uh, even that we brought cooperation from West Africa over in, in mutual aid societies um, and sushis and all of these different ways of pooling our resources, borough society, pooling our resources together, mm -hmm. uh, whatever they may be, whatever crumbs we might have, we pool them together and we created churches and uh, historically black colleges and universities. A lot of great things have been created with little, little amounts of money, but collectively and that's what can happen in, right. in any business um, and that's why I like co-ops but there has to be a mindset of working together and that's where this training happens uh, two or more people together you're going to have conflict Yeah, any marriage you're going you're gonna to have conflict uh, and uh, in, in the training for co-ops you learn how to resolve the conflict without going to the okay corral Okay, <laughs> without right, right. In, in, in a way. Right. So that's that's what I like about co-ops. Uh, 
all of the training that has to happen, and it happens, and therefore you get a lot of success, just a tremendous amount of success in this co-op world. So what does the future look like? What do you see coming down the road, in particular with policies? I think there's – I'm very excited about the future. We talked about housing. That is what we're going to see with Congress. What we're going to see in the next few years is a focus on affordable housing, and that's conversations that are being being had throughout the country in cities and in communities. And limited equity housing co-ops are going to be part of that conversation, and they should be where people are able to live in a housing co-op together and be able to afford it. And we're going to see that conversation evolve as we in the next few years. The other thing, and we we talked about this, we're going to see black and brown and LGBTQ communities start seeing that this is a way to do business and this is a way to work together together. And we're going to see we're going to see a lot more of this in these in these cities and urban areas, which is makes me very excited because it could be the next REI. You know, the REI started out small, and I look at REI. Yeah. So I think so I think employee owned, and then uh, housing, and then you know, and you're going to see a place where where you get grocery food. I know we're in the D.C. area. If any of, you, any of your listeners ever get out to Fredericksburg, stop by the food, Fredericksburg Food Co-op and see what a grocery co-op looks like. It looks like a Whole Foods, if, if not better. Uh, they do some amazing things. And what they do, they, they continue to work with community and do community events. And they're tied to the community. So those are the three things that I think you'll see as we move forward in the future. So you get – there's a food, a food co-op called the Glut in, mm-hmm. Right in Maryland, on the other side of, of D.C., it used to be in D.C. They moved out to Maryland. It's a worker-owned uh, co-op, a uh, food co-op. It's a little funky uh, food co-op. I've shopped there. Great food, great per- great music. And then I've also uh, shopped at the food co-op in Maryland. Oh, just lost the name of the city. Right north of D.C., there's a food co-op. So I'm trying to get Silver Spring. uh, Silver Spring. No, it almost came. Right next to Silver Spring, but Mm -hmm. um, there's some food co-ops, and I and I tell people just go to Google and Google food co-ops nearby. Uh, I went to one here in Atlanta called Savannah Food Co-op, and that's what I did. I googled food co-ops and found it, and went by and visited it as I do when I'm in different cities. So you can go to Fredericksburg, but it's an hour drive. Tacoma Park Food Co-op. Tacoma Park. Yeah, that's right. Um, and that's probably 15, 20-minute drive uh, from D.C., north of D.C., and the glut is um, that's east of D.C., straight out Rhode Island Avenue. So there, there's food co-ops closer by, and you can go talk to people and, and visit them and get good nutritional foods. What about, uh, have you seen much growth in worker co-ops in D.C.? I, D.C. has, to me, has turned a corner. I did some research on some of this, especially D.C. D.C. has a long history, you probably know this very well, D.C. has a long history of supporting cooperatives. And I, and I did some research recently, and I was just really amazed about how, how they went about that and what they did. And so that legacy has continued to, to to be there where there's been different organizations, different nonprofits doing work in the, in the workers co-op space there in DC. And we are just now starting to see like uh, some movement on there. We just gave a grant to uh, the beloved community incubator in DC uh, recently innovation grant that is, is promoting entrepreneurship and employee owned worker co-ops. So, uh, so, yeah. So we're starting to see DC come around as well. So in this last minute, I'd like to know: Is do you do you like your work? I do. I do. It's it's a really cool job. I, I, I you know I grew I grew up on a rice farm. I didn't really imagine I would be in in DC 
working with Congress, working with, with, with agencies and even the White House at times on, on, on policies and good policy like cooperatives. I mean, think about all the things people work on that try to take things away from others and, and, and have a negative aspect to it. But I get to work on a great issue like cooperative policy. So I'm, I'm really pleased and really my, my, my dad passed away when I was 16. He was a, he was a rice farm. I think he'd be proud of, of the work that I'm doing right now. So in this last 30 seconds, you want to give a shout out to your wife and two daughters and the Razorbacks? Yeah, thank mo- mostly the Razorbacks. Uh, for you, for you basketball fans out there, I'm announcing right now the Arkansas Razorbacks are winning the national championship in basketball. So get ready; it's the best team we've had since Todd Day and Lee Mayberry. So uh, I thought you were going to talk uh, about but, your eight year old and eleven year old. Yeah, my, oh yeah, my kids, my kids, uh, Lexi, uh, em- Emmy, and my beautiful wife Jennifer, who's been a huge supporter. We got to go. Thank you very much, Ariel. It's a pleasure. All right. Thanks, Fernand. See you all next Thursday. 1450 WOL, where information is power.